Okay, um, to get started this afternoon, grateful to have Dr. Paul Goodman here with us today over uh, Zoom, and so we're grateful to have him here. Dr. Goodman is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine. He graduated uh, over 10 years ago and has been in practice with his uh, brother. Uh, they own a few practices. Um, I had an opportunity to uh, listen to one of his podcasts uh, on my way into work today through the Dental Amigos, and he was talking a little bit about uh, 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 associateship contracts and those type of things. Uh, I had an opportunity to talk to Paul, Dr. Goodman, for the first time a couple of weeks ago. And the thing that amazed me most, especially if you look at his website, is I do not know how he does everything he does. And he told me that he figured out a way to clone himself. So <laughs> I figured out that little secret from him. But very, very, very grateful to have Dr. Goodman with us today. And so uh, if you'll give him your attention, I'd appreciate it. Thanks so much, Dr. Harrison. I really uh, want to, I'm honored to be doing this. Really the first time I've done something like this. I love to be able to connect with dental students. I think they're lucky to have someone like you who's trying to keep them apprised of what goes on after dental school, what happens in the real world. Hopefully I can share some value in the successful dental career transitions, a little bit about buying a practice, finding a job, even what happens when you sell a practice. So there's a lot of people who've introduced me over the years speaking. I've been a speaker for like over 15 years. Uh, but today I brought with me uh, a four-year-old uh, who's now five to introduce me. So we'll just watch this little video here for a second. Hi. Hi. I'm 41 years old. What, what do some people call me? Dr. Nacho. Dr. Nacho. What's the message of dental nachos? Just be nice. Just be nice, that's nice. Do you, are you involved with dental nachos? No. Do you think being a dentist is a tough job? Yes. What do you think is hard about it? Uh, working. Working in a small place? Yeah. Now, you go to school. What does your teacher teach you about your friends? Um, um, what makes someone a good friend? Play nicely. Play. Which one? I know something. It's like, what about if you have something and one of your friends wants it? What do you do? Break it in half. <laughs> That's not a bad idea if it's food. But what if you can't break it in half? What would you do with that? Uh, if I have another one, I would give it to her. What if you only have one? Would you do one with them? What's the word we use? Share. Share. That's nice. I remember last week you forgot your show and tell. And one of your really good friends, what they do? Yeah, one of their And what was the thing they shared? Oh, that was nice of her. <laughs> so, that's, it makes you feel good when people share? Yeah. Do you think Dennis should share more? No. <laughs> Why not? Because they're working and they can't smoke. But maybe what about, did you ever go to the uh, one of our seed courses and you saw the dentist there? Mm. In your pink dress? You went to one of those. What about when your sister grows up? Will you share stuff with her? Oh, no. You won't? Why not? Oh, no, yes. You will? No means yes. No means yes is opposite? No. Uh, okay, well, tell do you have any other final messages for Dental Nachos? Mm -hmm. What's your final message? I'm, I'm going to say no. No. But that really means yes? You are in good training to be a dentist. Uh, Okay, well, there's a message. Thanks for sharing with Dylan Nachos that they should do what? Just be nice, share with their friends, no. and have fun? No. Does that mean yes or no? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing with us. Thanks for being such a great moderator. We really appreciate the work you do on the groups. Okay, guys, so uh, that is usually my intro to courses because I want everyone to remember that we are people first, dentist second. I don't know how to put myself back on. Hold on. Oh, there I am. So now you guys can see me. So that is my daughter, Daphne, and when I started Dental Nachos, I don't know if you guys noticed, you're a dental student, so you're pretty normal. You're on your way to being dentist. 
who are not normal. So I encourage you to embrace, you know, how you work before dental school with meeting friends and caring about people. Dental school is a tough time for all this. Uh, some of it just has to be tough with what we learn. Some of it, the schools could do a better job of bonding us together. One of my goals is after dental school to really bond dentists together with, whether it's online or face-to-face. -face. And that's a perfect start for talking about successful dental career transitions. Because I was just out at the dental intelligence meeting and they're interviewing me. I said, there's four important steps in a dentist's life. One, finding your first job. Two, buying your first practice. Three, do you want to add an associate to your practice or not? And four, selling your practice. And they don't really review this in dental school, and they should, because you need to start thinking about it. You start understanding how this world works, and it's a lot different than what dental school, the dental school world is like. So let's start off right away. There's a dental practice. that's called Paul's House of Dentistry and Nachos. I think that's a good name for a practice. And it collects a million dollars a year. What is it worth? What can we sell it for? And why does dental school not teach us how to make one of the most important decisions of our life? So you're in dental school, you're gonna be out of dental school. Most of you, I probably can't see you right now, but raise your hand if you wanna own a practice someday. I'm gonna imagine that most hands are up, okay? If you wanna own a practice someday or work in private practice, that's gonna be the majority of people. So dental school, you're too busy to teach this because what are some of the things you're teaching? So I'm gonna review a couple of things at dental school. Uh, has taught me that have not helped me once in 17 years in private practice. Number one, the Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle is yet to have gotten me out of a jam. How to do a bike rim in three hours. I was particularly good at that. Personal favorite, how to make yourself seem kind of weird when talking to patients. So one of the things I talk about is how we can communicate better with patients, how we can be less weird. Because dentists, when they talk to patients, talk really, really weird. They say things like that bridge is a failure, which also you feel like, you know, patients saying you also kind of a failure. Uh, instead, you can say, hey, we eat 1,000 meals a year. Your bridge lasted eight years. That's 8,000 meals. Way to go. It's time to replace it. We can dial down the drama. So much talk of failure in dental schools. One of my personal favorites at 1030 in the morning, you might be saying to your patient, Millie, we can't do a bridge here. Your teeth on either side, uh, they're virgins. I mean, that's just an uncomfortable word to hear in any environment, virgin, especially to maybe a 78-year-old when you're talking about the teeth on your side. Sometimes I think, you know, what is, what is Millie going to say? What about the teeth in the back with the big fillings? Uh, they're going out at night. They're morally corrupt. Just, just joking a little bit, but let's stop saying that. And let's be a little more normal. And let's learn normal things. So right up front, what's something that you can remember from this long Dr. Nacho rant that we're going to have together for 44 minutes? And I would like to, if I could add this to the dental space, what is the most important factor in valuing a practice? So we'll go back to that practice, million dollars a year, Dr. Paul's house of dentistry and nachos. And what is that practice worth? So what, how do we determine? So if you're sitting there with Dr. Harrison, he can tell me, you know, raise your hand if you think it is location, where the practice is located. Is that the most important factor? Raise your hand if you think it's the number of active patients. Raise your hand if you think it's the net profit. Raise your hand if you think it's total collections. So up until 2011, I would have voted for D and I would have been wrong. So no one taught me and I even bought two practice. I started, I was with a practice with my dad and we bought another practice and I thought the answer was total collection. But the number one most important factor in valuing a profit is net profit to the dental owner, net profit to the dental owner. So when I do practice transitions or buyer coaching, that's one of the first things I ask. This practice is, on, is, is listed at 1.5 million. How much is the owner making? And the right answer to that is for a practice lifted, listed at 1.5 million, the owner should have net profit of 600 to $750,000. I mean, the, a dental practice is worth 1.5 to two times the profit as a quick summary. There's other things that go into it, but if you're taking notes, and remember one day this will help me, a dental practice is worth one and a half to two times the net profit as a general range. Oftentimes the listing price is much higher than that. Now. You guys are there in uh, uh, Louisville, I think is, is, is where your school is. That's where Dr. Harris is, right, Ariel? Louisville, mm -hmm. perfect. So in Kentucky, maybe there's like super hot area where all the nice restaurants are and, and bars and everyone wants to live there. A practice there is gonna be sold for more than one 40 miles away, which maybe is less desirable. So location is a part of it. Active patients and total collections are important too. But if you remember just that one tip, I've done a good job for you here today. And he here are other factors that go into valuing a dental practice. Location, active patients, insurance profile, number of operatories. What's the dentist doing? So I believe you guys are all third year students. 
So you're like, I'm going to do a crown. It's going to start now. It's going to end in two and a half hours. No, I'm just joking. I mean, dental students aren't always particularly slow. You just have to wait for every step to be checked off. It's a like patient sitting in the chair. I'd like you get a check for that. So I remember those days. But when you are in the real world of private practice, how efficient you are matters. So let's say you're buying a practice and that owner, Dennis, did a lot of Invisalign and Endo. And you can't do Invisalign and Endo. That might not be a good practice for you to buy. So when evaluating a dental practice to buy, current net profit to the owner is very important. So at least here in the first seven minutes, I gave you a piece of information that most dental students do not have, most dentists do not have, so you're armed with this to go into the real world and build your nacho plate. If you think your practice management and business skills, clinical skills are important too, but we'll just focus mainly on business and, and practice management today, and you're building these toppings, I do love nachos, uh, like my shirt says and the, the sign says, you're building this, that, that topping goes into that is important. So what is my one goal for every single lecture that I give? So I talk on buying practices, selling practices, I talk on implants, I talk on practice management, I talk on factors, factors affecting the new dentist, the medium age dentist, the season age dentist. My one goal for every lecture is exactly the same, and that is to make dentists happier. But it's hard to make people happier. No one really can define happiness. If I say to you right now when you're sitting there, what makes you happy? You might say, I don't know, long walks on the beach, time to myself. It's kind of ambiguous, but I know what makes me annoyed. So what are some things that make me annoyed? So when my patient cancels because their cat died again, right? So when a patient's like, I can't make it to my appointment because you, you know, my cat died again. One of my personal favorites on the patient says they cannot lean back in the chair. You're like, today we're gonna do a 15 DO. Not gonna be easy, Millie. Uh, I'm gonna lean you back in the chair. You start leaning her back, sit up. I can't lean back any further. Sometimes I want to look at those people and say, how do you sleep at night? Because if you don't sleep in a chair, we need you to get back. Uh, when you show up, I don't know if this happens here with your, I know you guys are all classmates and friends. So when you work in the real dental world, you have these team members, right? Dental assistants, there might be six of them, but not everybody shows up to work in a good mood. So sometimes you show up in a good mood and your coworker doesn't. That is not easy to deal with. Just like Daphne here, she's ready to go. Drew is not ready to start her day. So annoyance is super easy to define. So one of our goals at Dental Nachos is to increase happiness by decreasing annoyance. Sparrow and Ariel working with me does require a giant bottle of tequila like that. Um, but we like to have fun. We like to decrease annoyance. This is a good picture of me here on Halloween from last year with Drew, where I'm answering something on Facebook, feeding Drew at the same time. So it requires multitasking to be a successful dentist. Because multi when you're in dental school, you're focused mainly on how do I get this filling done? How do I get this crown done? How do I graduate? But in the real world of dentistry, there's so many decisions that happen all day long in the midst of your clinical time. People are asking you questions about insurance, about people paying, about bills, about uh, companies you have to deal with. So now's the time to get kind of your multitasking brain ready. So let's make you happier by being less annoyed by every and any stage of your journey. There might be some parents out there. If you're a parent and you see this, it is meltdown. This is not a good, good, this is not a good place for your child to be. I don't know what we said Daphne couldn't do. But we want people to be more like this. I want you to feel more like that yourself. So my recommended toppings to increase happiness by decreasing annoyance are don't drop your nachos on your first things in your dentisting life. Don't drop your nachos on the first things in your dentisting life. Everything that matters needs a system and always be managing expectations. Realize that things will go off script, embrace reality and make the best decision in the moment with the information that you have on hand. And develop, I'll bring that one back, develop your team of advisors to help you, support you, and not be afraid to tell you when you've lost your nachos. So I'll use this in dental student terms. It could be a, it could be a, a girl or a girls or guys, but maybe you're getting dressed for, I don't know, the dental school. Do you guys still have the, like, the Odonto blast? Or we had that when we were in dental school. Some sort of dental school formal. Your friend's like, does this outfit look good? And in that moment... You can just say yes and not annoy yourself. And you can do that thing, I don't know what you call it, lie. You can lie and say it looks good. Or you can be that type of friend who's like, you know what? That might not be the choice that you want to make for a December formal event because it looks like you're going to a club in Vegas and it's not a good choice. Who is that person in your life? You need to find them and put them on your dental team. It could be an attorney, it could be a buyer coach, it could be an accountant. So if you're taking any notes, or you want to take any pictures of these slides, take a picture of this slide. It will help you in your dentisting life. So. Also, as we go along, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to stop and answer them. This whole thing is for you guys. Uh, this lecture could be like, you know, 
five hours long, so we have 50 minutes of something, you know, you want to ask Dr. Harrison to stop, happy to stop, pass the mic around and, and answer a question for you. So what are the very important chips in the life of a dentist? And we're going to talk about those today. What is the best first step after dental school? Is my associate position a car or boat? So I say golden nacho a lot. So golden nacho means these are things that are so important to know the answer to. These are scripts that are important to talk to your patients about. So in your life, if you came to me three years from now and said, I got this job, Dr. Nacho, help me with some coaching. Is this a good job? First question I'm going to ask is, is this position a car or a boat? A car is a need, a boat's a want. So does the owner dentist need an associate or want an associate? We're going to go over, over that. Why buying your first practice is pretty much the most important decision you're going to make in your entire life. And the why for that is I sell practices and I meet dentists at the end of their, their practice career, sometimes the end of their life. And they have had one, two, three spouses and they still have one practice. So practice, once you buy it, it anchors you to that area. So it's important to make a really good decision on that and how to sell a dental practice that minimizes stress and maximizes happiness. So why? You guys are dental students. What are you in debt? A billion dollars? Is that a number? So you're in debt. you got to get out of debt. You're going to buy a practice. Why does it matter to you about selling a practice? Because sometimes we have this thing in dental nachos. Another golden nacho is we have to do people's job for them. We have to do their side of the conversation. So when you are talking to a seller, they're likely not going to know a lot of answers. So you have to think, I know both sides of these things. I was a big John Grisham fan, uh, uh, the um, uh, crime writer, the, the lawyer. One of the, uh, his books I read recently on a plane for lecturing was Rooster Bar, eerily similar to dental school if you want to read Rooster Bar. But there was a defense attorney and there was a prosecutor. So sometimes I think you've got to do both sides and know both sides. So even if you're a buyer, you have to know what a seller's thinking. If you're a seller, maybe one, some of your instructors are sitting there, they want to sell their practice. They got to know what a buyer is thinking. So who am I? Why did they bring you here? Uh, me to talk to you today. These are some of the things that I do. I don't know if I should brag about this, but there's probably no other dentist on earth, okay, ready to brag, that talks, communicates, texts, Facebook message, Instagram, LinkedIn messages, talks on the phone, more dentist than me. I put myself in the center from all the different things I do. So the best thing I can share about you is I know what dentists think from the ones I talk to. Doesn't mean I talk to all the dentists on planet earth that are in the US, it'd be like 250,000. But what do I do? I own two practices with my brother. So I'm a private practice owner. I think of myself like a practice parent. I'm a transitions broker with United Dental Brokers of America. I work for the seller. One tip, red, golden nacho, orange nacho. When you buy a practice, dual representation brokers are toxic to our industry. They're gonna say to you that they work for both sides. Oh, they work for the buyer, they work for the seller. Uh, they work for the buyer, they work for the seller. Don't get a lawyer involved. Don't get an accountant involved. When you hear that, say, that's a red flag. That's an orange nacho. I'm going to get my own team involved. I'm not a dual representation broker. I either work just for the seller on a deal or I'm a buyer coach on the other side. So it's important for you guys to know. Teach dental implant courses, my podcast, The Dental Amigos, that Dr. Harrison is nice to talk about. So you're a student. Raise your hand. Uh, what is the favorite price of a dental dentist or a student for anything that I offer? The answer is free. So dentists love free stuff. People love free stuff, but especially the dentists. They really like free stuff in dental students. So this podcast has 47 episodes, and it's totally free. If you challenge yourself to listen to one episode a week, in a year, you're going to be such a bigger, stronger, more prepared dentist for the business of dentistry, and it's out there for you guys. I know I'm going to sound like the person who said they, they walk uphill in the snow to school both ways. I know that person's always annoying, but I'm going to be that person. When I was in dental school in 2002, no Facebook, no podcast, just your friends. If I, didn't, I had three friends. They didn't know the answer. I was out of luck. So now you have these podcasts and when you're working out or taking a break or walking around, listen to an episode of the Dental Amigos. There's also other great ones out there. One of my friends and, and someone I admire, Dr. Mark Costas, the Dental Entrepreneur, is another great podcast. Help dentists by practices and teach at residency programs and did this big giant uh, Facebook group. These are the moderators that you met before. That's Daphne and Drew. One of my favorite things is the New Dentist Boost Camp, where we help young dentists get better at what they do. We do it in person with 15 young dentists and we live stream with any age dentists all over the world. So how do we apply the Dr. Nacho toppings for your life? So first step after dental school, is your associate position a car or a boat? 
why buying your first pack is so important and remind you why selling it can maximize happiness. So let's start at the end and go back to the beginning, like one of those movies that nobody understands. Memento, Mahal and Drive, maybe this out of your guys' uh, uh, time frame. But those movies, they were very difficult to understand. They started at the end, they went back to the beginning. I'm going to do it in a way where you can understand it. So let's transport you into selling your practice. You're 62 years old. You own a practice. Dr. Paul's house of dentistry in Nachos. It does a million dollars a year, and we're going to sell it. And this is going to start giving you the answers that you need to know. Because selling your practice is like sending your practice to college. That's my wife, and getting paid for it. So we need an interested seller. So first, the seller can contact a broker. Sometimes they DIY it and try to do it himself. It's hard to do that to sell your dental practice. Easy to do it with a house because we have all these listings online. With dental practices, it's a private confidential thing. So we can't just blast it out online. Your team's going to get worked up. Your patient's going to get worked up. So we get a broker involved. Discuss goals and uh, realistic expectations. Gather info on the practice. But I'm going to give you some of these golden nacho tips. So the valuation range for a practice sale is different than an independent appraisal. So maybe you're sitting there. Like my dad, he was a dentist. Uh, we worked together for 11 years until he passed away. Amazing dad, amazing friend, amazing mentor. So when I joined the practice, we got an independent appraisal that's different than a valuation. So if you want to get an independent appraisal, we have people that I can uh, connect you with and sponsor us and be um, our consultants with us. They will say, here's an independent appraisal. Put it somewhere that's safe. Give it to your family. If something happens to you, they're going to need this. A practice valuation to sell is going to be valued to sell. It's usually going to be a little bit higher. There's not going to be as much detail that goes into it. So just so you know, an independent appraisal and evaluation are two different things. Types of interested buyers for dental practices. Now, you should pay attention to this. Make, if you want to ask any questions, you can. So you're going to sell your practice, doctor, whatever your name's, house of dentistry and nachos, does a million dollars a year. Who can buy it? So if you think, who am I going to be competing with as a buyer? to buy this practice because a million dollar practice with five operatories with let's say it makes $362,000 a year. So I'm the owner of it. I make 362 a year, 1.5 to two times the profit. So we know 540 to like seven, I don't know, 724 is the number. So let's say it's listed for 750. This practice is listed for $750,000. Who can buy your dental practice? And this is something that I think people are just really unaware of that there's different types of buyers now. 25 years ago, really one type of buyer, just young dentist buying an older dentist practice. Young dentist buying an older dentist practice or maybe a group. So first, traditional my first practice associate. Okay, so you're an associate somewhere, you wanna buy a practice. Second is going to be a small group run by general dentists. That's like my brother and I. Third is going to be a large group run by general dentists. And fourth is going to be a corporate or DSO group. Okay, so those are the, if you're taking pictures, take a picture of this one on our YouTube page, Dental Nachos YouTube. We have all kinds of videos on this. If you want to look, look them up, I have 10 minutes of me talking about this. But these are the people who can buy a dental practice. So these are the people you'd be competing against. Now, what are the differences between these types of interested buyers? Traditional my first practice young associate. So you own this practice, but then you're buying it. You're in some sort of weird matrix of dentistry. You're selling your own practice to yourself. So 32 year, 30 year old you, 62 year old you. If you do a million dollars a year out of five operatories and you make $362,000 a year, and the practice is sold for 750, and a young dentist comes in to buy it, the older dentist, the seasoned age dentist, I might as well tell you about some of these things now. So some of you might be dental not just fans, but we have our own language. Language. So if you are zero to two years out, a student is zero to two years out of school, you are affectionately known as a bad. You are a bad, you're a baby age dentist. That's a bad. Who's selling this practice? If you are 25 to 40 years out of school, you are a seasoned age dentist and you are a sad, okay? Sad. And if you are 10 to 25 years out of school, this sign, that's me, Dr. Harris, I think we're in the same category. This sign typifies me is made of red. You are a mad, medium age dentist. So when a bad buys the practice of a sad, the sad has to leave. So maybe you want to leave, but when you leave, you're not going to make any more money. You're going to get your 750, you're going to go. Second choice, a small group run by general dentist. If I was going to buy this practice, I would want the seller to stay on. So they'll get their 750 and they'll work for two or three years. Maybe they'll make extra money. Maybe that's something, they would make extra money. Maybe that's something attractive to them. Third is a large group run, run by general dentist that's usually required to stay on for a longer period of time. And a fourth is the DSO, okay? So if you raise your hand, who's heard of a DSO? I know it's a big topic. We'll talk about it a little bit today. 
Are DSOs evil? That's a little bit ridiculous. This is not a movie like Dennis drama. They're just a thing in our world that dentists have allowed to get in and they're not gonna leave anytime soon. So you're gonna have to deal with DSOs. I work with DSOs, find associates for them. I work with all different types of people in the dental space. I wanna help as many people as possible, make this a more responsible world. And one of the best way to make it more responsible is with information. So just so you know, if I was finding a job for a DSO and I thought they were a bad DSO, I'd be like, I'm not gonna find anyone for your DSO because the last three associates said you was treating them. So I try to keep them honest. I try to make them treat young dentists in a way that is helpful to them. Remember, DSOs are large groups of practices put together. They usually have some sort of private equity money involved in it. And that's gonna come into play when we talk about what we can sell this practice for. So we valuation listing agreement, discuss the valuation for sale with the owner, agree on a listing price, get ready to meet some buyers. Why can a DSO pay more? So another good slide for you to take a picture of if you are taking notes. So we're gonna take a picture of this slide. So why can a DSO pay more for your practice, Dr. Paul's House of Dentistry and not yours? And here is this why. One, traditional My First Practice Young Associates needs bank finance. And you want some good news? The bank's gonna probably give you $850,000. Some banks are giving even a little bit more than that, but there's gonna be a limit to the total dollars that they give you. Small group run by general dentists. We still need bank financing for that. So banks don't always wanna to loan to us after we buy three to four practices. A large group run by general dentists. If you run a large group, and I'll give you guys some extra tips here. If I run a group that does $10 million in practice sales, just running that group, I should make 10 to 15% profit for the group. So every year, one to 1.5 million, we make as profit. If you run that group, which I don't run, maybe one day I will, our group is a small group, less than 10 million, uh, you could use some of your profits to buy the practice. But the DSO can pay more because they do not need bank financing, so the total dollars is likely higher. The DSO is funded often by private equity. So if you were gonna sell that practice, you could sell it to traditional My First Associate, $750,000. Small group run by General Dennis, $800,000. Large group, $820,000. Corporate DSO, they may pay a million dollars because they may want to acquire that practice. So they're willing to overpay. No really such thing as overpay, but they're willing to overpay because they can just get money from this giant pile of money that they have somewhere. Any questions on why a DSO can pay more for a practice that's being sold in 2019. So Dr. Harris, if anyone has any questions, let me know. You can stop for the Zoom chat or just stop me with the microphone. So let's keep going along here. And some of this we'll go through quickly so we get to the job ones. It's a longer presentation. I introduce the sellers to the buyers. It can take a year or more. Buyer and seller meet. Uh, meet, meet as many dentists in person as you can. Go to as many practice showings as you can when you're looking. It will help manage your expectations the broker will like you and you will learn something. So even if you think, I don't want to buy this two operatory practice that there's $500,000 a year. If it's an area where you live, go see it because I will tell you, maybe you'll buy a bigger practice and you'll acquire that practice and Velcro it onto that, on that practice. So follow up with the brokers after you visit, talk about a verbal offer. I'm going through this today. I got a text today uh, with a verbal offer. They're turning this into an LOI. We have a great episode on LOIs. Uh, in the Dental Amigos. Great one for you to listen to because LOI is a letter of intent. That, so we submit a letter of intent. I, I recommend you have an attorney fabricate it. Seller has a timeline to move forward. LOI to asset purchase agreement. All the hard work gets done. So you're digging into the practice, active patients, true profit, all of these things. You Can you back out from LOI to asset purchase agreement? Yes, but you don't want to. So if you, if you don't want this practice, don't submit an LOI. But from LOI to asset purchase agreement, you're digging into all the Fast in the practice, dental focus attorneys fabricating this, start credentialing with insurance. This is part of the due diligence. Make sure your bank financing is secure. Not the first time you should have contacted a bank. Asset purchase agreement, buyer and seller go over that. This can take weeks to months. Sign the asset purchase agreement. Meet the existing staff before closing. This could be an entire 50 minute presentation on its own. When do you meet the staff? When do they say, hey, there's gonna be a new owner here? That's a whole discussion. It's important to think about that. Review that with your dental focused attorney. You're going to close, have a margarita, your practice owner, and that's the circle of life for selling a practice. Any questions on practice sales before we go to your first step after dental school? Does anyone have any questions? Dr. Harris, are you doing okay uh, in there? 
Yeah, we're doing good. They're all awake still. Perfect. All awake. That's good. That's, that's my criteria. Not asleep. It's like my criteria for occlusion. What's my criteria? Not high, right? Is this crown not high? Perfect. That, be on your way, Millie. So let's talk about the first. So now we talk about selling a practice, something that you think is in the future. Like I think when my kids are 18 is in the future, but it's going to happen before I know. But let's talk about what's in front of you right now. What is your first step after dental school? Everything that matters needs a system and everything matters and always be managing expectations. Those are two things we say a lot at my dental office and my dental nachos team. So what can you do after dental school? Okay, this is just, I think they should talk for first years about this, but awesome that we're talking this in the third year. First, you could be a private practice GP associate. Second, uh, you could be a private practice GP owner. You can be a specialist or do a GPR AGD. If I only had five seconds to talk to you, I'm a big fan of doing the GPR AGD. Life is really long. Private practice, it's not going anywhere. You got your whole life to annoy yourself in private practice. The GPR AGD year is magical. You get to practice with support. You get to try things you can't try in private practice. You get to work on your systems. You get to extract teeth, do bone grafting, make bone grafting, maybe place implants, endo. I love it. I think we should require it. I know not all states require it, but do yourself the favor of JFO. So what does JFO mean? It's a golden nacho. JFO is just find out. Just find out about GPR and AGDs. Just contact the programs. Don't be in such a mindset where you're definitely going to do one. You're definitely not going to do one. Research it. It's an important step. If you talk to dentists who've done a GPR AGD, over 90% of them are going to be thrilled and going to say it's an awesome experience, whether they're 60 years old or 30 years old. So talk to a lot of dentists. I've done polls on this in Dental Nacho. Military, public health, retire and become a high-level break dancer. I wanted to do that. My break dancing skills were not good enough. So this is what I kind of think of as where you're at after dental school. You're not sure if you're going up, you're not sure down. Maybe you should be wearing a helmet like Daphne because I don't know what she was doing here. Just want to tell you that I'm very dedicated to being a dental educator. So I don't want to brag. I don't really like to brag about myself, but I'll brag in a second. I don't know if there's something I should brag about though because take a look at this picture here, right? So I was at my shared workspace. We have all these awesome courses in Philly, Broad and Locust. Philly's a great place to come. Hope you guys visit us in person sometime. I turned around and Daphne was doing this, but I didn't help her. I got out my cell phone. I took a picture because I said, this would go good in a lecture. And I used it in lectures hundreds, if not thousands of times over my, well, over my career. So that's what I will do for you. Glue this to your, to your mind with my own daughter, uh, sort of almost trying to injure herself or get a helmet on. Here's something, here's reality. So you guys see my face. What's crazy is pr prior to dental nachos, I was just doing all this in Philadelphia. People would always be like, talk to Paul, he's so positive, he'll help you, he'll help you find a job, he'll tell you what's going on. When I went online, I started posting things on Facebook. I was very surprised to hear that some people thought I was negative. Some people thought I was a doom and gloom guy. This did not, I could not understand this. What I realized was when you type something on Facebook, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, when you email something, it's read in the mind of the person who's reading it. They don't have the context. I won't text my wife, we need paper towels, because I will get a text back being like, what makes you think I never buy paper towels? Or you could buy paper towels yourself someday. So I will call her and say, hey, are there any paper towels? So context is important. But this ADA income slide, take a look, because the purple line is, the, is general dentist and their average income. The yellow line is specialist. So first, if you're sitting there, simple thing is specialists make a lot more money than general dentists most of the time. So if you're thinking of being an oral surgeon or periodontist, I say stick with that feeling. It's a good feeling because they make like twice as much money as most general dentists. Second thing you should be concerned about, and I talk about this all the time, sets us up for talking about uh, our finding a job. The starting salary for a general dentist when I got out of dental school is the same as it is in 2019. This is a big math problem because income is not going up, but loans are going up. So this is something to be aware of. And we should all be concerned whether you're sad, mad, or bad because insurance, uh, insurance uh, reimbursement is declining. Do people need more or less dentistry? That's a whole other conversation. Young people, I mean, hey, raise your hand if you're sitting there in dental school and you have more than five crowns in your mouth. I don't think anyone's raising their hand there. If this was 30 or 40 years ago, people would have raised their hands. So the need for general dentistry in populations that go to the dentist is challenging. So it doesn't mean cry on the inside, cry on the outside, be doom and gloom. It just means to be aware of this so you can prepare yourself as you try to pay back your loans and enjoy your life.
So always be managing expectations. More training at an early stage will impact your way, the most career, most amazing ways. So I know you're in debt and I know it's tough, but get more training, whether that's CE, GPR, implant courses, patient communication courses. Here's an important one. The more geographically flexible you are, the more opportunities you have. So there are opportunities for dentists to make more money in areas that are traditionally less popular to live. So if you think you're gonna to go to San Francisco, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, DC, Austin, Texas, uh, Miami, Florida, it's gonna to be tougher. I didn't say impossible, just said tougher. Most specialists that practice as solo dentists make a lot more money than general dentists who practice as solo dentists. Why? Because specialty procedures are valued more than general dentistry procedures. So what periodontists do is valued a lot of times, like $1,000 an hour. What general dentists do when you add it all up is probably like 300 bucks an hour, 400 bucks an hour. So that's something for me to help manage your expectations. Develop your dentist for early and never stop. If I can give you some advice and maybe one person will take this and maybe one person will say, I saw you back in 2019 on this crazy Zoom thing. You were ranting about this and I did it. If you go and join Toastmasters, you don't be a public speaker, but if you join Toastmasters, your case acceptance will skyrocket. You'll be better at talking to people. Toastmasters, it's free. It will help you learn how to present yourself, how to get words together. I have a lot of CE on this. I love this topic, how to communicate with patients. It's so important. So develop not only your clinical skills, but your minds, hands, and words. And this here is Aaron Elliott. So one of the things that I like to do is develop speakers. And I really love speaking. As you can probably tell, I'm here in Philadelphia enjoying all this, speaking to you guys. But I am a 42-year-old male. And we do not have enough female speakers. And I bet you, if you look around the room right now, there's going to be just as many guys as girls in that room, maybe even more girls. And I want to develop role models for females because their dentisting life cycle is different than a male's in general. So what happens when you have a child? Do you, do you, how do you take a three-month break from practice? How do you balance a family? And, and this, these are things that are going to impact all of us. I have an amazing female associate that runs our satellite practice. And what would happen if she came to me and said, I'm going to have a child. I'll say, awesome. I have children. You'd be very tired, but it's worth it. And she says, I need to take four months off. Who comes and works in my practice? This is an enormous issue that's affecting all of us because I have seven team members that work there. Do I close the office for four months and they don't have a job? Who am I going to get to cover? What dentists are out there that I could get to cover for? So think about this. And Erin Elliott, follow her. She's an amazing dentist. Big in the sleep apnea, but she said, pondering is that a word from a dentist in a mid-sized dental office in Northern Idaho. So if you're on Facebook, say, hey, Aaron, Paul was talking about me today uh, at this lecture. She will give you some great perspective. She's active on social media, but here's something that I had her write for the group because it was important to me. I do a lot of what would you do if you could go back in time? So it's not about regrets, okay? It says, what would you do if you go back in time? She said, one thing I've learned in the last few years is the importance of camaraderie and mentorship. I wish I could go back to my younger self and tell her to just get more seed, even if that means debt and time away from my young kids and husband. I could have used the time away, I realized anyway. I could be so much further along in my dentisting. That's a term I coined because dentisting is a full body experience, emotional, social, spiritual, faculty. I realized the power of someone pushing me or mentorship. Who is that person for you guys? I have amazing mentors that I wish I sought out sooner or had someone like that early on. So when you're sitting in dental school, it seems easy. There's a lot of instructors around. There's people you can talk to. But when you get out, it's tougher. So you've got to build that community for yourself. So in our last 13 minutes, and I can stick around and answer a few questions or you guys can jump in, how about some nacho tips on how to find a good associateship or associate in the real world of dentistry? How to find that job. Don't drop your nachos on your first job. So one thing I would like to read is the majority of dental students or residents do not realize that finding your, most, your first job in the real world is the most important thing they should be thinking about from third year on because there's no application you can fill out in private practice. Whereas the kids say you cannot ghost the job. So in the world of dating, people say I ghosted someone or I got ghosted. That means people just stop talking to you. In dating, you just move on, get a new person. In jobs, very difficult. So you will likely stay in the job too long. So make sure the job that you get is one that's gonna be a good one. There's no perfect way to do it, but everything that matters needs a system and everything matters. So I'm gonna help you now in 12 minutes. Remember this, it's gonna help you. Is it a need or a boat? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, is it a need or a want? Cars a need, boats a want. Both sides need to understand their why. 
and ask questions to reveal the most accurate answer. So if you're sitting there, this is football season, you could be a guy or a girl, both people like football, so we'll just make it a person. One person's on a date with another person, and the person on the date, in their mind, they love watching football on Sunday, okay? It's important to them. So they might not want to say on the date, can I watch football every weekend and watch the Eagles and not spend time with you? Not, not a good use of words, right? Question would be, what do you like to do on Sundays to someone, right? What, is, what do you like to do on the weekend? Now, if the other person says, Sunday is my antiquing day, and I go antiquing from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., you know immediately that is going to conflict with you watching, Ariel's here, the Eagles every Sunday. So you might be like, this person seems nice, but I'm not willing to give up the Eagles for antiquing. Same thing with jobs. you got to ask good questions to reveal the answer, and I'm going to give you these questions. Of all the slides, I make hundreds, not thousands of slides, this is the most, one of the most important, golden nacho. So if you go on a job interview or you're hiring someone, these questions have to be answered. Why is the practice looking for an associate? What the practice wants the associate to do and how the associate will be compensated. Why, what, how. Every interview, you gotta get those answers when you come back. Most of the time, the dentist cannot answer them in an articulate fashion. So let's talk about some of these whys and hows here. First, you gotta get your dental self out there. Get your dental self out there. Post resumes on many dental sites as possible in Facebook groups. I run with Chance, but one with Chance Bovini, practicerail.com. Go to practicerail.com. You'll see some jobs listed. You'll see some associates, uh, associates with profiles. It's free to create a profile. Make one of those. Check sites daily for job postings and talk to your mentors. Send professional emails and cover letter, letter to the dentist your area. The most important thing, show up at local CE. So if you're sitting in that dental school and you think you want to work right around the dental school, go to local CE. Meet a dentist. Now you think, I'm not staying here. I'm going back to Austin, Texas. I'm going back to San Francisco. Go to the same local CE as your friend who's staying in Kentucky. Why? You're going to practice your networking muscles. You're going to practice your meeting people muscles. And surprisingly, I don't know if anyone's sitting there and they met their soulmate. They have a boyfriend or girlfriend, totally in love. Your soulmate, you're done. Maybe you're married. You met your best, you, you married your best friend and soulmate. Look at you. Good job. How did you meet that person? Did maybe somebody introduce you to that person who knew them. That happens with jobs too. So even if you're in Kentucky talking to a mad, they may know a medium age dentist in San Francisco who they went to dental school with. So show up at local C courses, spend the money. If you call someone who runs a local C course like me in Philadelphia and you say, hey, it's 39 bucks to go. Can I come for half price? I'll usually say yes. I'll usually try to get you to come for free. If it's a big event, there's always student pricing. This is just as important as your clinical skills. Develop your networking skills. Take this money and put it towards it. Now you may be sitting there saying, but Dr. Nacho, I don't have any money. I have a lot of loans. And I'm gonna to say to you, are you the person on Instagram in a, on a vacation in another country? Is your Instagram story showing you in Aruba, Ibiza, one of those places? You may be laughing because that is you. So I'm not saying don't go to Aruba. I'm just saying if you find Aruba money or vacation money, you also can find $500 to $1,000 a year to invest in yourself for after dental school by going to local regional CE and meeting dentists and talking to them. Get as many state licenses as possible. Super important tip. So even if you don't think you're gonna work in the surrounding area, get a state license. You can always get rid of it later, but I've had dentists lose $10,000 because they didn't have a state license and they couldn't start working in time. That would have been worth the five or $600 they would have paid. Special tip for you guys, write down this technology, Loom. Make a Loom video. If you wanna email me, I will send you this Loom video. It's also on the Facebook group. This is me saying what I would do if I was in your shoes. And here's what it'd be. Hi, I'm Dr. Paul Goodman. I went to Penn Dental School. I graduated in 2002. I did a multi-year GPR. I'm looking forward to working in private practice. I like doing implants, restorative dentistry, and working with other people. I'm excited to be a dentist. I would love to meet you please reach out to me at paulatdentalnachos.com. So you make these Loom videos and you send them to people who you're either interviewing with or someone else who are really gonna stand out. A talking video, 60 seconds or less, just about you. I'd be happy to send you this one if you reach out to us. Now let's talk about the interview. With seven minutes left, let's talk about the interview. You're both interviewing each other. The OD, that's the owner desk, may not know it. Take out a notebook, like a medium-sized notebook, and say, oh, I wanna jot down some questions. In this notebook that you have, Let's just say it's this 
in this notebook, on this side, write the questions that I tell you so you don't forget to ask them. So you see, I'm going to jot down a few notes, but you have your owner dentist cheat sheet here. Starter question. I've been looking forward to this interview. You have a great practice. Always be nice. I would love to hear more about why you're looking for an associate. Then be quiet and listen. Most important thing. After you say something nice, nice office, great practice, I'm just wondering, why are you looking for an associate? And here are the answers you want to hear. True need, replacing an associate. In my office, if you were interviewing with me one time, one of my few, very few people have listened to me in life, like four or five people, but this person has. She worked for me, did a GPR, worked with me for a year, and went to a perio program at West Virginia. So she worked with us for a year, and I had to replace her. So I said, why am I looking? Our awesome associate, Dr. Jill, is leaving for perio. We're so happy for her, and we need to replace her full-time, replacing uh, someone full-time. Offer procedures the owner dentist will want to do. So maybe they'll say, we'd like you to do the endo in the practice. That can work if you can do the endo. So they may not want to learn it themselves, but add you. But can you do these procedures? Extraction, endo, place implants. That's a need slash want. Want looking to significantly reduce the dental hours of the owner dentist. They want to keep the open office open. Really busy, not a good answer. Just a feeling. Busy is a feeling, not an answer. If you want a secret nacho tip, a golden nacho, someone says, I'm really busy. This is what you say. Oh, man, it's great to be busy. I know a lot of dentists are looking for patients. So great you're busy. You're now giving them a compliment. When did someone schedule a crown with you next? Okay. So in your schedule, when is an opening for a crown? Here's the answer you want to hear for them to be really busy. Six weeks or more. Golden nacho. When can they schedule a crown? Six weeks or more. They say, oh, they can get in a week from now. They're not that busy. Two weeks, not that busy. Three weeks, also not that busy. So the current associate's leaving. It's all about the why. They're moving. That's good. Things didn't work out. You got to dig a little bit. So I don't know if anyone's seen Sebastian Mastapa's stand-up comedy. He's one of my favorite stand-up comedians. If your friend was just like, I broke up with my boyfriend, and you said why, your friend's like, just didn't work out, you're going to start asking questions. You're going to start digging. So when people don't give you an answer that's specific, you got to dig a little bit. Most important answer, uh, most important question is what is the why? Listen carefully. I, you can say things like, I see where you're coming from. Can you tell me more about it? your associate leaving, starts on practice, moving, fighting with the team, not doing work that's acceptable to you. Things didn't work out. Ask about those things. And here's a great golden nacho. Can I reach out to the associate that's leaving to learn more about the position regardless of the reason? If they say yes, it's a good sign. If they say no, it's a possible problem. Wants to offer additional procedures. Generally, they're a good sign. You gotta make sure you can do them. Associate dentist has to be able to do that and the owner has to be able to invest in them. Reduce the hours of the office. They gotta be willing to make less income. It's very difficult to do that in fee-for-service practice. PPO possible. Uh, you also may experience loneliness and stress if you're working at a busy office by yourself. So it's one thing to have a job. It's another thing to be the only dentist there in this busy place with nobody to turn to. So you have to realize that in your personality type. As we wrap up here, let me just get some important things out there. We talked about the owner dentist being really busy. They need at least $800,000 in income. You have to be aware they're going to make less money. How to start looking for a job. It's a lot like dating. Put yourself online. Talk to people you know. Cover page and letter. Associate compensation. So you need to ask how you're going to get paid. Is there going to be CE? Uh, are you going to get paid on a percentage of production or collections? I believe very strongly in the daily safety net guarantee where, hey, no matter what happens in my office, people get 500 bucks a day. So if they make $100,000 for the year, but 33% of collections was 120, they get an extra 20. They never go below the 100. You have loans, you have expenses. If there's no daily safety net guarantee, that can be dangerous. Here's something about the insurance gap. It's showing us in an alarming way how the gap between the listed fee and what insurance is pay is growing. And that's a challenge. So we've got to ask about what insurances that they take and embrace reality and make the best decision in your life. Here's an example of, you know, uh, insurance. One of the things on my YouTube channel, I have a great thing of how to explain dental insurance to patients. It's a benefit that acts like a coupon with blackout dates. Benefit that acts like a coupon with blackout dates. So think like a dentist chef with mentorship. Get some good mentors out there. If you can't choose cleanse your loan, so I don't know, I'm a dad. Uh, sometimes you're a dad, you get this like dad type body sometimes because you're just watching your kids all the time. You think, I got to lose 15 pounds in two months. Maybe you juice cleanse would work. But if you have to lose 150 pounds in two months, juice cleanse is not going to work. So don't get overly concerned about paying all your loans right when you get out. There's actually some dangers to paying your loans too quickly. 
if you're not saving for a practice. Wrapping up the interview, and this is just a good last thing to end on here, uh, Dr. Harrison, if we were asking questions. Do not sign a contract for employment without having a dental focus attorney review it first. Because when you have this happen, nothing bad can happen. The attorney's either gonna say, great contract, looks good, you're set up nicely and protected. That's well worth the 700 bucks they charge you, the 800, the 500. But what you're really paying them to say is, oh man, there's so many red flags, the restrictive covenant's too long, you're gonna, you're gonna damage your chances of finding a practice. See this line here? This means that you have to pay them back if you don't meet your draw. So do not sign a contract without a dental focused attorney reviewing it first. So I'll leave up some of my contact info here at the end. Feel free to reach out to me if you would like to. I tell you you can hold the baby and drink margarita at the same time. That's Daphne. And Dr. Harrison, if you would like to throw up any questions, I'm happy to stick around and answer some. I know you guys got to go to the clinic. Hope your clinic time goes well and uh, your bite rings uh, fit or anything you're doing fits uh, there. Uh, if you want a prize, uh, we have text prizes this is on, on communication. Dr. Harrison can get that to you as well. Text Salsa to 444-999. You want a, a prize there. And I just want to leave it my email here at the end. You can see this lecture has a lot more to it. So we can always, I can come back, Dr. Harrison. Happy to come back for another uh, session. Okay. Talk about just being nice. Oh, that's, that's our, and there's our information here. Uh, that was me and the moderator losing one of my dad battles. So Dr. Harrison, anything else I can answer for you guys? No, thank you very much. We appreciate it.